Hi everyone, um, everything you wanted to know about off-manage drainage but were too scared to ask. Uh, I'm Ian Bullock from Carpenter Surveyors and I'm joined today by James Warren of UKDP. Over to you. Thank you. Yep, so um, I'm James, I'm one of the directors at UKDP, UK Drainage Professionals. Um, we offer a UK-wide service for the assessment, repair and uh, installation of off-manage drainage products and we're based in Maidenhead, Berkshire, Manchester and Glasgow. So I guess we'll just jump through the three key systems. So we'll talk about cesspits, septic tanks and modern sewage treatment plants. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, perhaps if you just go quick run through for each one. Uh, that's Absolutely. useful. Okay, so we'll start with a cesspit, which is fundamentally a large watertight holding tank. Um, the older styles would be rectangular in shape. The modern day ones are like um, uh, torpedoes underground. They all do the same thing. They take the grey and foul water from a property the tank fills up, it needs emptying, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, normally they require emptying six and eight times per year. Quite expensive, they're large assets, they take up a large footprint in the property, but if the ground can't support a soak well, or there's no a water course to discharge to, a cesspit is the only option for a property. Yeah, no, indeed. And, and we do still encounter those quite frequently on surveys. So um, I think obviously once we've identified that, then it's just looking at perhaps sort of suitable alternatives or making sure it's compliant and Absolutely. making sure it uh, is fit for purpose, really. So so that's obviously cesspits, which is the sort of, I suppose, the least desert, desirable option. The um, most rudimental option. Yeah, yeah exactly. So so I guess on to the next one, which is an interesting one, because this is quite common, um, septic tanks. So again, lots of different things, but if you can just give a quick run through on those. Yeah, of course. So, you know, the most common off-main system is a septic tank. Once again, historically, it'd be built of brick or block work, concrete. Um, modern day ones are fiberglass or glass reinforced plastic. Uh, it works through displacement, so there's no treatment whatsoever. Inside the septic tank is a, uh, a capacity for the waste to come in and it settles. And the cleaner water that settles is allowed to exit the tank and drain away typically into some sort of subsurface irrigation system or soakaway system with the ground then naturally just disperses it. Uh, yeah, so just perhaps we'll move on to the super duper modern sewage treatment plants. Yeah, so effectively when you look at it being um, installed, it's the same as a septic tank, same size, same shape, but inside you have different compartments where after the separation of a septic tank, you then have a treatment zone where oxygen is permanently supplied. This creates a good bacteria called biomass, which deals with all the nasties that we produce. And then on the final aspect of a sewage treatment plant um, is a final effluent zone where any suspended solids can settle to the bottom. And what comes out of the sewage treatment plant is so clear and clean that it's allowed to discharge to a watercourse, a culvert, a ditch, and it's completely okay with the environmental regulators. Perfect. Let's perhaps talk a little bit about the sort of secondary areas, such as the drainage fields and discharge, etc. So, okay. yeah, just give people a little bit of an idea on that. Fine. So, a, a drainage field is a series of perforated or slotted pipework. Um, for a sewage treatment plant, because the effluent quality is so good, so clean coming out of it, the drainage field is purely there for dispersing that clean water into the ground. It's completely different when that drainage field is serving a septic tank. The septic tank only separates the waste and the water. The soakway then treats it as it then goes down through the subsoils in the substrate and down to aquifers and away. So it's very important to ensure that the soakway and the septic tank, although they're two separate items, one cannot function without the other. Yeah, so that's great. That gives us um, a good overview. Uh, let's jump to septic tanks for a second then. So it'd be useful perhaps for the audience to know a little bit more about um, how septic tanks originally started out. Uh, and what they might find today, because obviously just the development of those two. So yeah, Definitely. So the old-fashioned septic tanks would be rectangular in shape, built of brick or block work or concrete, and the wastewater would come into the first chamber, it'd separate, go to a second chamber. In some instances, there'd be a third chamber, and it followed the same path. Chamber one, allow the waste and water to separate in periods of calm, typically overnight when no one's using the facilities. And then as it goes through each chamber, it's getting slightly cleaner each time. Uh, building regulation state, a septic tank must be a minimum of two zones or compartments. So that's horizontally um, separating, which is absolutely fine. And it works through displacement. 2,000 litres come in, 2,000 litres go out. Hopefully a little cleaner on the way out. Um, in 1965, a specific manufacturer introduced a septic tank where it worked through, instead of horizontal separation, it went vertical. So this tank is called like an onion tank, purely because of its shape, and the first ever one was called an alpha. 
and it works the same way. Uh, separation occurs, the cleaner water is allowed to separate and it goes through something called a baffle cone, it looks like a light shade, and then it's allowed to exit and then uh, introduce itself to the soak away to be dispersed evenly underground. Let's just talk people through um, a common sort of setup really. So we've got a photograph here with MH1, manhole cover, inspection chamber. Uh, we've then got the main septic tank chambers one and two, uh, and then we've got the distribution chamber. So it might be useful for people to understand a little bit how they link together and what's going on here. Yeah, absolutely. So MH1, as you say, is manhole one. All the uh, facilities will feed through pipe work into that first manhole, MH1. When the cover's lifted off the top, you'll just see an exposed half pipe or a channel pipe in the bottom. That allows us to see that everything is flowing correctly as it should do to the septic tank. If we then lift the next two covers in sequence, we see exactly the same thing. Two identical chambers, chamber one and two. Water should start to be cleaner in the second chamber if things are working well. And the final one is the most important one, in my opinion, the distribution chamber. Mm -hmm. Once again, such as Man 01, when the cover is lifted, it should just be a free-flowing half pipe or channel pipe. If there is an issue there, it allows access for rods or any unblocking device and certainly a camera to ascertain if there's any issues whatsoever. That distribution chamber should lead to a soakaway. So it's that perfect last opportunity to gain access and see exactly what's going on. So let's talk a little bit now perhaps about um, failures and where things can go a little bit awry. Um, we'll go through them in order again. So talking about cesspits first of all, um, let's talk a little bit about how not necessarily can go wrong, but things to look for and things that might lead to, to upgrading maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first indicator is if um, the emptying uh, frequency increases. You think, well, that's strange. There shouldn't be much difference from what's coming into it. If you excuse the phrase, uh, it's really a case of um, if a tank is, a cesspit is emptied and we can hear or see a water ingress, we concentrate on that area of the cesspit and there may be what used to be a superficial fracture, which is now a structural fracture, allowing groundwater in, which is contributing to the cesspit filling artificially and then the consequence is uh, further emptying from the customer. It gets very expensive very yeah. quickly. In that scenario, you're looking at if a repair isn't possible, it's a replacement of the cesspit itself. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also worth noting as well on that that um, you know what can be okay for one might not be okay for another. So, for example, on a recent survey, um, farmhouse, uh, you know, just a couple living in the property, uh, perfectly acceptable sort of sizing unit for that. But obviously, a new family moving in, um, you know, two, three, four times the size of effluent coming into that system, that's not really going to cope with the same amount. So, is that something to? No, yeah, that absolutely. That's a really good point. And also on top of that, it may be that when the cesspit was originally installed, it was fine for the facilities that were in play in the 40s or 50s but modern day living means there's more facilities more water going in add to that mix a bigger family yeah. then yeah that's going to fill up so quickly and it will highlight that the cesspit is clearly not sized appropriately on modern day regulations no, absolutely and i suppose that brings us then nicely on to septic tanks so uh, obviously jump into that again you know an evolution in terms of the off manage drainage world but let's talk about perhaps how they can go a little bit awry as well because obviously there's problems there as well yeah so there's no moving parts in a septic tank but there are more aspects to be damaged a septic tank is controlled by dip pipes or t-pipes that control the inflow to make sure that the wastewater comes in at a lower level inside the tank and certainly uh, from a protection perspective if a dip pipe or t-pipe is has just fallen off or has been damaged in any way, there's no protection for the soak away for the fats, oils and greases that should always be retained inside the septic tank. So you're looking out, that's the first indicator, we're looking out to see if any of the dip pipes are, are off for any reason. Once again, there could be tree root damage, just structural damage, could be a deterioration of the mortar or the rendering might be coming away, allowing a little bit of groundwater to come in. Once again, you can only see these issues once the tank is completely emptied and let the camera do its work and find out exactly what's going on. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, and I suppose, again, moving on another step with modern sewage treatment plant systems, they seem to be the evolution of all, you know, previous one and two. Um, and again, be interesting because obviously they can go wrong sometimes and there's things to think about with those as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there's a, yeah, even more. There, now, there are a few moving parts in a treatment plant and there's many different manufacturers that work them slightly differently. The effluent quality is still of a, a certain quality that can go out and escape to a, a ditch or a water course. But a lot of sewage treatment plants are negatively affected by what the property owners are putting into it. Uh, too much bleach, um, any products like that will kill the good bacteria and therefore there'll be no treatment inside it. So there may not be any structural issues with the asset itself, it may just be a 
change of habit that's required from the owners of the property. If there's too many rags or tissues, they can actually uh, go around a diffuser and, and stop the air being blown into the treatment zone. Uh, once again, that means it just won't work. It means the blower will burn out. There'll be alarms going off left, right and centre. Uh, or just like the cesspit or the, or the septic tank, there may be some structural damage, which is allowing groundwater in or letting the wastewater out. Yeah. So once again, it's all about the thoroughness of the inspection to ascertain exactly what's going on. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit then maybe about um, signs or symptoms of things that might be an indication that there's a problem with the system or something's going awry, things to look for, really. Absolutely. Um, the Probably the most common one is where a customer has complained of a specific boggy patch in the garden area. Uh, even worse than that, maybe a sort of grey, oily film within the water on top of the uh, on top of the garden. That that is an indicator that the soakway is failing or has failed. It means the water can't disperse underground anymore, and it's finding a place to escape. And unfortunately, it's coming up through the garden. If it can't escape through the garden, it's going to go back to the tank, and that could surcharge. Or worse than that, it could come all the way back to the property, and then we have the issues of facilities being affected such as the water level inside a toilet rises before it falls again it may be gurgling in a shower tray it may be really strong odors um, for any of the facility just using a washing machine or a dishwasher it means you know the water is not getting away quickly enough and it's holding somewhere um, it may be and this is for cesspits treatment plants and, and septic tanks it may be that the frequency of empties has got more and more People will notice that because they'll feel it in their pocket straight away. It could be a soft blockage somewhere, um, sometimes not. It could be something more fundamental. It could be that the soakway has gone away. It might be there's an external factor helping to fill the system up too quickly. Um, but they, they are the main indicators that something isn't right. It doesn't always mean the worst case scenario. It just means that perhaps you should get it looked at thoroughly to ascertain what is the cause of the issue. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so let's talk about the regulations that affect off main strains in yeah, general, really. Absolutely. I guess. Um, there are three main ones that we look at every single day. First one is the Building Regulations 2010, Part H, Section 2, that covers all things off mains. I know you're impressed. Uh, <laughs> second one is the British Standard 6297, that's 46 pages, all about the uh, assessment of a drainage field, how they're installed, different versions of, uh, of the same thing there. It's an excellent read, I like that one. Uh, and the most topical one at the moment is the Small Sewage Discharge General Binding Rules, um, uh, released by DEFRA and sort of policed by the Environment Agency in England yeah. since January 2015. Yeah, that's one of the most frequently talked about things lately with clients, so perhaps we'll talk about that then, I guess. Um, so yeah, if you just want to give people an overview of what that means. And, Absolutely. And really. So the... General binding rules, as they're tagged, um, simply means that if a septic tank has been installed after January 2015, it can now only disperse to a drainage field. That is the only discharge method that is now acceptable. And when we say drainage field, we're talking about a, a series of piped or slotted um, four inch pipe work underground, laid almost flat, one in 200, so the trickle is so slow and so calm all the way through the drainage field. Um, the issue is that septic tanks historically have just gone straight to a ditch and that is now unacceptable. So that would be a non-compliant system if a septic tank was discharging to a water course. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I think that's quite important because that's that's something that we'll come up more frequently against and um, we've certainly seen that with our clients. So, yeah, it just stresses the importance of having the system looked at properly, getting the right advice with the professionals on your side and from the survey on our side as well, you know, bringing all that together, Absolutely. as we said before, to reach a positive sort of conclusion, really. Yeah. So, so just to sort of bring things uh, to sort of a conclusion as such, but we've talked a little bit about what off main strategy is, the types of systems, the sort of things that people will uh, come up against, symptoms to look for, what regulations apply, that sort of thing. But I think the important thing to stress with this is that, you know, knowledge is power and at the end of the day, if they get the right advice at the right time, and this applies to people whether they're buying or selling, um, it's going to take a lot of the stress out and uncertainty of the process. So, you know, get that information as early as possible. Talk to the professionals, you know, get your survey, um, get our survey, bring them both together. Um, you know, because there's a lot of synergy there in terms of what we can add to the process. Uh, and that can only be a good thing for sellers and buyers alike, um, agents, solicitors uh, and surveyors. You know, I think it's just sharing that information. So, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned sellers. Um, it's becoming more common now that a seller wants to jump on the front foot 
and ensure that the system is up to date mm -hmm. to prove to any potential purchasers they've got a perfectly compliant system. Or if there is any, if there are any issues, then they can either make that a condition of the sale that they've allowed X amount to be put aside, or they can go the whole hog and replace the system and then present evidence that that, that system is now beautifully compliant and anyone buying that property has got complete peace of mind. That can only be a good thing, you know, that's going to just move things along smoothly rather than last minute, you know, this, this crops up at the end and it's and it's too late. Brilliant. So, yeah, no, thank you very much for that today. That's been really helpful. I hope the viewers find that quite interesting. There's lots to learn. There's an awful lot of guidance there. But, you know, I think it's it's just reaching out if you need any advice. Um, you know, James or myself be happy to talk to you, engage with you. If you've got a problem with drainage or buying property and need advice or even selling for that matter, um, feel free to reach out. So I'm Ian Bullock from Carpenter Surveyors. Um, and obviously James here today, James Warren, UKDP, um, I'm sure he'd be happy to, to help as well. Yeah, thank you Ian, thank you for letting me come down today and if you wish to visit the website it's uh, ukdpsolutions.co.uk or feel free to email in at info at ukdpsolutions.co.uk. Perfect.